company called Publica. Um, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about their CEO, Joseph Mark. He's going to let you ask him anything at all about his instant pay distribution channel for books and the author's or rights holder's own business model. Uh, very flexible, and he's a first-time exhibitor here at the uh, San Francisco Writers Conference. So I'm going to turn it over to Joseph. Thanks, Barbara. Thanks, Barbara. One microphone moment. So two authors and a reader walk into a bookstore. And the bookstore's owner says to the first author, you are really famous. I know you. You've, you're a number one bestseller. How can I help you? And the famous author says, well, I'm about to launch my next number one bestseller. And what I want to know is... If I come down here for a signing, can you get me the national television, the national radio, and the national newspapers to interview me? And the bookstore owner says, no, nah, I don't think I can do that. But I could put your book in the display window. And the famous author says, ah, no, nah, thanks, and storms out. So he turns to the other author and says, can I help you? The other author says, well, could I have my book in the display window there? And you think maybe you could bring me a blogger? And the bookstore owner says, nah, not unless you want to bring me hundreds of readers to buy your book on that day. So that author slinks out. So he turns to the reader and says, how can I help you? The reader says, can I have a travel book, please? And he says, this is your lucky day, right there in the display window. We've got travel books right behind the luggage and the travel socks. <laughs> so what I noticed when I came to the San Francisco Writers Conference is that um, everyone is talking about marketing, and we do have some publicists on the panels, but um, marketing is one of those topics that's hard to talk about, hard to achieve, um, and yet for those who do marketing, it seems so obvious and a no-brainer. But there is a chasm, a chasm, a gap between those who know how to do it and those who don't. So Publica is publishing on the blockchain, and that sounds like a, technolo a technology play, and I'm ultimately from Silicon Valley, but it's not. It's a marketing tool, primarily a marketing tool. So the reason we call it publishing on a blockchain, we could have left the blockchain part out of the phrase, except it's really important when it comes to marketing. First thing you want to know about blockchains are they are global. They don't know what country they're in. They're in every country at all times. So if you publish a book on the blockchain, you automatically have new markets. So what's a blockchain? Well, if you've ever played a video game and you're playing with other people online and maybe you win some points or some gold coins you put in your pocket, you close, you close the computer and you come back to play later and the game syncs up with everybody else and you still got those coins in your pocket, that's how blockchains work. They just keep going. Uh, the most famous and controversial one is Bitcoin. You'll see it on the news now and then, uh, mainly because it is controversial. It's the oldest one. It's very simple. It only does one thing. It just prints Bitcoin. It doesn't have any other functions. But there are hundreds of blockchains running today, doing many critical jobs, including uh, energy, uh, supply chains, banking, credit cards, and so on. So Publica's particular blockchain protocol is just for publishing. Uh, yesterday, Carla Olson mentioned on a panel um, for independent publishing that books are like startups, and I couldn't agree more. Um, I spent my life in books and startups. And one of the things about a startup is that the founder wants to get themselves out of the company as soon as possible, especially if you're an author. You've got another book in you. You need to move on. So that brings us back to marketing. The other thing that blockchains can do for marketing is all currencies. I mentioned they were global. That means no matter what currency the book buyer happens to have in their wallet at the time they want to buy, that's the one we take. And you might be astonished to know how many people have cryptocurrencies in their wallets now, burning a hole in their pocket, and they want to buy books. If you want to learn more about that, we have a channel that we call The Publicans. There are 3,000 of them, and all they say is, can we please buy some books? 
So there's a market right there. And the first person who publishes on the blockchain, of course, has a guaranteed market. We have a publican here in the room, uh, Land MacArthur. He's an independent public guide. And what that means, uh, he also has, uh, uh, um, he has some cryptocurrencies, <laughs> uh, wants to buy books. But a public guide means what we used to have in the book business, book packagers, which was also an incredibly important part of marketing books. Because a book packager puts together the whole shebang. Uh, they used to find the right publisher because the publishers would do marketing. But they did many other things, such as put together the right uh, illustrator, editor, publicist, uh, ad copywriter, uh, and today they would be including your bloggers and, and video bloggers and, and so on. So the book packager functions come back. We call it the public guide to guide you through publishing on the blockchain. Uh, it's not scary. Uh, they're just a little bit of learning curve to uh, the new technology of today. And don't worry about the new technology because two decades ago, um, Internet and the web were a new technology that most of us couldn't use in a sentence. Uh, these things just come, right? So I'll be back next year, and uh, everyone here will know exactly what a blockchain is, and they'll have a wallet anyway. <clears throat> so, and, so you're not late uh, to the blockchain technology and what it can do for publishing and authors and books and readers. Um, we uh, announced Publica on December 1st at Future Book, seemed an appropriate place, and this is the first announcement of it in the United States. Back to marketing. <laughs> um, Blockchains are newsworthy. Uh, we're quite certain that those people who publish on the blockchain right now are going to get news for that reason alone. And that kind of takes your marketing outside of the genre issue. Um, I know that one of, pack, one of the packages that Bland has underway is science fiction fantasy. Or is it fantasy science fiction? I don't remember. But it doesn't matter because it's going to be newsworthy anyway. Um, and so that's an advantage that will probably last for years to come. And fourth, probably, I think this is the most important part of marketing, so I save it to last, so I have a couple minutes to talk about it. And go back to my story about the two authors and the reader walking into a bookstore. To the famous author, they already have 1,000 true fans. And yes, I'm quoting Kevin Kelly here. Uh, recently quoted by Seth Godin uh, on his new new podcast. They're popping up everywhere, <laughs> and that's great. Um, and yes, of course, I have a podcast. Who doesn't? Um, but a 1,000 true fans, uh, that means those are the people who already know you and already are going to support your book. So the blockchain gives them a tool to spread their support around the world. Uh, as you know, books sell best by word of mouth. Why? Because the person who is recommending it to me, they know me. I'm personally not impressed by book reviews by people that I don't know. I don't even bother reading them. I know that I know how to make robots write them, by the way. And, um, but what we can do today uh, is, with the blockchain, we can make that as a basis for all the financial transactions, including the free ones. Think about that for a second. Including the free ones. That means that if I were to buy the audiobook or the ebook edition or a token for the paper book edition or all three, I can buy them in any quantity. I can give them away for birthday presents, Christmas presents. I can, um, uh, I'm, and because Carla King writes um, travel books, I want to use that as an example. Uh, if I buy her book and I go to Valparaiso, Chile, and I meet someone else who wants that book, just hold my phone up to theirs, and I can sell it to them or give it to them. And if I sell it to them, Carla would get a percentage of that sale, effectively making me her sales force. Again, this is about marketing. Word of mouth, person to person, six degrees of separation will take you around the world. And because the blockchain is global, doesn't matter where I am or who I'm talking to, when I sell Carla's book to them, or give it away. Or in my own personal example, I worked at the United Nations for a while in Tanzania. Next time I go back, I'm going to be donating a lot of books to the schools and the libraries there. Not possible with uh, uh, current uh, digital ebook uh, technologies. So that's why the blockchain and the thousand true fans idea. 
Spread it, word of mouth, six degrees of separation will take you around the world, and it's a global market. There's something else that we can do with blockchains, because all the transactions are recorded on the chain, uh, including the free ones, including the wholesale ones, including the retail ones. That means we can use uh, computer algorithms <clears throat> to recommend books with natural lang language processing. And we're in San Francisco. That was invented a little bit south of here, down in Silicon Valley. And it works great. Uh, it's been used for many, many things. It just hasn't been used for book recommendation before in this way, where the machines have a record not only of what's in the book, what's the emotional path of this book? Is it the hero's journey? Was it written for a seventh grade reading level or for a university reading level? Um, was it clearly written in French originally and then translated? Does it need to be translated to French? And if it were, how would, well would it be translated by machines? Does it need some human assistance? All these things go together, and the machines are great at that. And that gives us the possibility to create what we call digital shelves based around any concept. Uh, we don't have that today in the current uh, ebook distributions, although, Mark, thanks for joining, because I want to recommend <laughs> to you that we help work this out. Uh, the digital shelves idea is that anything that you can describe as a reason to bunch these books together, just like you do in your own home, right? You have shelves. You have your own filing system. Machines can make your own filing system based on you and present that to you. Uh, and uh, libraries have a dual decimal system. You know, of course, that's metadata based. Uh, the machines are great with metadata. But we want to add to that the information about what the books have transacted around the world. When and where, how many, which book, and so on. And we can correlate that with other information about what's happening in the news that day. Maybe that had an effect on why that book transacted. So these are new things that blockchains can bring to publishing. Um, if you read about Publica, you'll see a little bit too much about Publica disrupting publishing, and I hope we don't do that at all. I have no intention of disrupting anything only increasing the marketing skills and powers and abilities of those who write and publish books. So are there any questions? Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, the only information that we require of an author is you're going you're to have to have an ISBN number. And if you've um, already got one from KDP, you would probably want to use that, although that's not an ISBN number. But we would allow you to use that. And I think underneath your question is, um, is the blockchain exclusive? And thanks for asking, because no, blockchains don't know what country they're in, and they know nothing about your other contracts with anyone else. So for example, with our marquee authors, which we'll, you'll start to see them appearing in about a month's time, we call them marquee because if you put their name on a marquee, you already know who they are. They already have publishers. So we're asking them to go back to their existing publishers and say, when we wrote this contract, there was nothing about blockchains, right? There's nothing in there about blockchains. So you publisher, would you like to have some of the money from the proceeds that the blockchain publishing brings? And I hope the publishers will accept that money. That should uh, take care of them. Yep. Sure. Um, so, um, W.B. Yeats uh, was crowdfunded, by the way, <laughs> and uh, so was Martin Luther's uh, treatise on good works. Um, there's good reasons to crowdfund, and there's a great uh, scriptwriter, I think um, is it Goldstein, um, who explained why, um, or Ryan Holiday in Perennial Seller, uh, explains that by the time you go to sell a book, there should already be someone who wants to buy it, even if it's only 10 people, but a thousand true fans is, of course, the best. Well. That's the time to rally those people. Let them feel part of it. Um, uh, there's um, um, Beta Books upstairs explains about how those people can help you make the book better. Well, let's make that crowdfunding at the same time. And unlike crowdfunding where there's only one deliverable or a package, uh, with books, as you know, they're different from other products. They can be iterative. There can be many editions. There can be the cheaper edition for students. There can be the more expensive edition for CEOs. <laughs> there can be all of the above. And the time to rally everyone together is in what we call the book campaign. 
and I think many people are going to think of that like crowdfunding because the crowd, that book campaign itself can help determine how much money will the author spend on finishing the book to what levels. Right? Um, you know, how, how much paper books will they stock? Uh, all of those things can be discovered during the crowdfunding event. We call it a, a book campaign. Yeah? What about the money? <laughs> the money. <laughs> what about the money? That's right. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, you know, authors talk about two things. <laughs> Marketing and then how do I get the, how, do, how much money can I have? Um, so, Publica can be a very small company. Uh, it's largely automated. So, our overhead is incredibly low. Uh, we have to charge a fee, much like a credit card fee, uh, because the blockchains do require electricity and people to maintain computers and so on. But the money, um, even though the percentage is really small, and that's achievable other ways, blockchains are forever. So once you publish on the blockchain, it's published. They don't go out of print. There's no concept of out of print. So the money goes directly from the book buyer to the bookseller, directly to their wallet, in a couple of minutes. So my example of selling my Carla King book down in Valparaiso, Chile, the money transacts as quickly as the book does. That means it's not held by Publica. There's no need to audit us. There's nothing to audit. It's on the blockchain. You can read it with any computer. And that's going to change the business models, I think. People are going to start to uh, think differently, new creative ways to do their business models. For example, we have one author who is planning to give their illustrator a percentage of the book sales up to a certain cap, give their editor the same thing but up to a higher cap, and then give their marketer a permanent percentage of revenue because she wants the marketer to stay involved and keep marketing the book forever. So that's a perfect example of what you can do with a smart contract on a blockchain, and it's completely automatic. And all of those transactions go directly from the payer to the receiver in minutes. So, uh, remember Carl Olson mentioned that um, books are like small businesses? They are. They're like startups. And blockchains are purpose-built purpose, purpose built for that. So, treat your book like a startup, make a little business out of it. There's another function of blockchains that um, uh, I think it was uh, um, with Sedwick, uh, the, the legal uh, author. Book marketing and book sales are like a funnel. Lots of discussion, lots of referrals, lots of individual book buys, maybe some wholesale book buys, all coming down to one wallet. Just boom. So you don't want to be buying a pizza every time a book sells. So with the blockchain, your sales and your tokens, uh, the records, uh, they'll remain on the blockchain until the author or the rights holder chooses to extract them and convert them to another kind of currency. So what does that mean? <laughs> well, uh, a long time ago when we only had publishers, um, we didn't have hybrid or, or do-it-yourself or independent publishing, uh, that meant that funds would collect into um, certain um, pots and then be distributed on periodic bases. And those contracts could only be written in one currency. And that helped foster the notion of different publishers in different nations functioning in different currencies. We don't have to do that anymore. Uh, the currency exchanges are pretty much instantaneous. And the tax laws vary. So if your book is a small business, here in the United States, the IRS has decided that virtual currencies are uh, capital gains as opposed to uh, income. And other countries may have different opinions. but um, but especially if you start selling in global markets, and certainly for me, where my wife's Norwegian, so we have a residence in Norway, I have another one in Florida. Uh, I pay my taxes in Florida, she pays hers in Norway. Um, it's perfectly fine to leave those the virtual currency in its digital wallet until it's time to pay taxes, pay bills, and so on. Because you don't want to mix your personal money with your work money anyway and it makes it very clear for your CPA. And there's no question of what the expenses were because it's right there on the blockchain. How many books did you sell? When did you sell them? In which tax year? It's all uh, incredibly simple. 
So on the financial side of running a small business, of being an author or a small publisher, a niche publisher, um, the blockchain should make that easier. Same reason that blockchain is the hottest new technology in finance and, and other industries. I'm going to try and stay away from finance and blockchain here, but because um, I think marketing is the most important part, but marketing always does come down to uh, financial transactions. Who gets paid, when and why and how. Um, so, uh, oh, so finding new readers. Um, uh, authors should have a platform already, and usually that's that means uh, email, uh, email lists. And if you come to Publica to do a book campaign for publishing on the blockchain, if you have an email list, great, we'll use it, and so will you. You'll get more. Right, your email list will grow. Um, just as Publica doesn't need any rights from the author or the rights holder, it also doesn't need their email lists because they're not our customers. It's the author's customers. It's the book's customers. It's the publisher's customers. So uh, all of that platform, we just accrue it right back to the rights holder. And we have our own fans, by the way. We call them the publicans. And, uh, and, and, but they're not interested in any specific genre or author. They're just interested in the publishing process in general about the blockchain. But there's, um, uh, in addition to um, email uh, kind of platform, there's also the, the uh, I did one blog post called um, uh, something about, um, you don't want to be bring a bigger megaphone to a sea full of megaphones. It doesn't do any good. What you want to do is whisper across a, a picnic table. That's what people will listen to. And definitely when they're trying to buy books or in, at wholesale or individual retail. So with your email list, whatever that platform is now, as soon as you bring it to a book campaign on Publica, the publicans themselves who are around the world in all languages, they're going to start talking about your book because it's there. And that's going to be like whispering across the, the picnic table. So you're going to gain new fans just because you're there. And the, and then that, that um, natural language processing is going to expose people who didn't know they were looking for you or for your book or for your publishing niche. The machines are going to help them understand if you like this kind of book, it's like book recommendations, but it's based on the content of the book what's in it, not necessarily what other people have said about it or the metadata that you managed to uh, post about it. Metadata is important, uh, those all matter too, but let the machines help. So the marketing platform that an author has will be larger and more powerful and more global when they finish their book campaign. So it's about amplifying that whispering across the picnic table. And there's a... So I mentioned blockchains are forever. So at some point, an author should go back to work on their next book, uh, but the book should continue selling forever. And if the, and I mean forever, until the electricity goes out, as far as we know. And no one's ever been able to turn off a blockchain yet. And so we call that a perennial seller page. And this, I think, can get interesting, because it's not the same as copyrights. Um, copyrights are meant to protect publishers from each other, uh, not from the readers themselves. Readers are not the enemy. Um, uh, Cory Doctorow and some of his friends did about five years of testing and study and found out that piracy on the first 75 percentile of books only helps the income of the author. They actually sell more and get more revenue if people spread their books for free because they only spread them to people that weren't going to buy them until they read some and you get new fans. The next 22 percentile, we say the, uh, you know, like my story, the, <laughs> the pretty famous author, um, they, uh, it has no measurable effect, uh, just not positive or negative. Nobody can find a difference. The top 3%, um, you know, the super famous authors, they can barely measure a slight uh, detrimental effect um, because, of course, why would you pirate anything except this week's top number one bestseller? 
That was true for years until uh, recently Fire and Fury came out. So for sale over there. And it, so uh, we all watched it closely, those of us who had you know access to data. And we discovered that, of course, Macmillan had uh, some supply chain problems. But the books themselves were still bought and bought and bought and bought. And people just found different distributors. They found ways to get to the book. This, they didn't get... Um, suffered much from piracy. I think that um, people are pretty much past the uh, the piracy drive. You can still find young people who uh, you know have on their computers access to these pirated sites. So of course, whenever I meet one, I ask them, "So what are you reading?" Well, it tends to be university books. That's what they tend to pirate. So um, we have a system for that as well, the, something the blockchain can bring to educational and academic markets, which I think is not this conference, but but uh, just as an example, um, your Chemistry 101 book, what do you do with it at the end of the semester? Well, the author doesn't want it back, but that makes the student the best possible sales force because they know who's joining the class next, so they should sell it right back to that next class's uh, students. And if it's an electronic book, it's in pristine condition. <laughs> uh, if it's a, but if it's a token, then that brings up the interesting possibility of: Do you want to exchange your token for an electronic book, or an audio book, or a paper book? And this can be up to the author and what the author wants to be selling. And again, I mentioned before that transactions go back through the blockchain, so the author gets to write their own smart contracts. Now, at this time, your eyes should be glazing over at all those possibilities. That's way too many possibilities, right? Well, we had that many possibilities before the electronic book age, before digital rights management and end-user license agreements uh, boiled it way down to just a couple. KDP, as you mentioned, right? CreateSpace is another, right? <clears throat> Boiling down the business models is really helpful for the industry to get economies of scale and to try and make book publishing hassle-free. But it doesn't serve the readers as well. And that's why I keep reminding myself of two authors and a reader walk into a bookstore. Because all three of them are involved. And the bookstore. All four of them, really. right? And I wrote one blog post called A Billion Stores with a Common Linkage. That's billion with a B. Because who's to say what a bookstore is or ought to be? Why aren't we all bookstores? Why aren't we all selling the books that we think are important to the people that we meet? Why isn't every club a bookstore? Why isn't every ski club a bookstore? When you go into the, the, mall, the mall, why isn't every store selling books in all formats? And I think the answer is that digital rights management and user license agreement systems make that extremely difficult. So with the uh, blockchain, I think we can uh, just make it easy. Yep. So what does it cost for an author to be a public? Why would we charge you? <laughs> uh, yeah. No, it's um, there is no uh, uh, direct cost. Um, uh, I think um, Brooke was talking about author subsidized. It's probably a good way to, to call certain kind of publishing methods. Um, Public itself isn't author subsidized. It's there's just a transaction fee for when a book changes ownership from one person to another. Um, but we do we don't do the marketing for you, right? We enable the marketing, but we also enable you then to bring in people who are good at it to help you uh, for a time. And so those payments can be made uh, by the author in their own way, revenue share. Um, from their own stock of, of uh, money, if they wish, um, entirely up to what works for them at any given time. So I hesitate to say that there's one model, because it isn't one size fits all. Everyone knows their own bank account. Everyone knows their own revenue streams. Everyone knows their own tax situation. And um, whatever you can make an agreement to, we'll put it on the blockchain. But public itself doesn't charge the authors anything. Yeah. Sure. Okay. So the most famous one is uh, called Bitcoin, and it was the first one. 
and it's pretty controversial, and it only does one simple thing. It just prints a Bitcoin, and people use it as virtual money around the world. It's very helpful for that. But blockchain per se, it means, it's made out of two words, a block of data, and then you put them in a chain. So it's like a really long-running spreadsheet, right? or an uh, adding machine where the tape just keeps going and going and going and going. And what's great about blockchains is you can't change the past. So if I sold a book and I bought a book and I bought a thousand books at a discount price or I offered a book at this price for this promotional period and then I set it to this price for a year and while I waited it for, for it to gain fans then, it, then I raised the price, nobody can change those numbers. They're just permanently there. So it, uh, it builds what we call digital trust which is very helpful around the world when you're selling in global markets. You don't have to know the other person. You can trust them because the data, the information about your transaction is on this blockchain. Hmm? Might also explain a little bit of the infrastructure technology behind blockchain and how they're independent, you know, networks. Right, the decentralized part. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the example I gave earlier was a video game that you might join and you might win some points or some gold coins and you put them in your pocket and then you close your computer and you come back later and your computer kind of syncs up and you've still got your coins in your pocket. Um, the uh, uh, blockchains are designed intentionally to run on anyone's computer who wants to run it. So it's what we call open source, meaning anyone can download the software and run it on their computer. And that's very important because that also means that no one can cheat. Uh, anyone who wants to can run another copy and, and check. And that's, it's called um, decentralized, right? Because there's no one central computer. So the blockchains that public uses, we don't own them. We don't control them, right? They're, they're owned by the people who own them all around the world. There are hundreds of thousands of them. So, that uh, makes these the blockchains really resilient, um, uh, and they just continue to work 24/7 because they're not relying on any one computer or any one central server or even one central town to host them. So another element in blockchains is uh, cryptography, which is another word for uh, secrets, and um, and so one. Um, the kind of cryptog cryptography that, that they rely on, uh, that we use, is called two keys. Uh, public key, private key. So your book, for example, would have a public key. And that's one half of the key that lets you access it and read it. The other key is a private key. Your key. <laughs> and uh, so when, we, when you buy a read token, the public system will compare your read token to the public key of the book and your private key and we'll decide if you have purchased the right to read that book. And we don't have to maintain massive central computers for this at all. It just, it's, it's so incredibly simple. It's hard to believe that anything that simple could work that well. Um, what else is there about uh, the blockchain technology? Um, uh, well, they can host what we call these smart contracts, which is so that, as our developers say, if you can describe the business model that you want to have for your book or your little publishing business or your big publishing business, we can code that into a smart contract. And the blockchain will uh, distribute it around the world so it works on every computer. Hmm? Yeah. Uh, what can you do with the office email list? Mm -hmm. We give it to them. Oh, oh, during the campaign, of course, we uh, we have a um, like a like a Mailchimp kind of uh, email distribution to keep people uh, apprised of the book campaign, let them know what the prices are, when it starts, when it ends, when you can do pre-orders, um, uh, how you can reach the author, um, what the kinds of additions are that the author can offer. Um, so that's uh, well done by email during the the book campaign. But the email lists, of course, they continue to grow because people get interested in the book that's coming up. And some 
some authors are uh, planning to um, to publish a different edition of a book that's already published elsewhere. And uh, one example that I heard from an author recently was they have a story. It's a hero's journey kind of fiction story, um, uh, but it's recent historical fiction. They're going to make a slight changes to it just to include the blockchain. It fits into their story perfectly. So that would be um, uh, a good reason for their email list to then spread it out to people they know that are interested in current technology, for example. So that would make a larger email list, and then we uh, give that back to the author. So does an author have to learn all about listening technology? <laughs> no, it, it's, um, no I, I want to explain it here, because I did come here to answer questions, and, and people are curious. But uh, there's no need to learn any of this. The author's journey that you can register for now should look completely normal. Um, you give your email address so that we can send you news about when your page builder is ready, uh, send you some advice on uh, um, probably the only thing that an author needs to think about is that you can come up with your own business model. Of course, you can ask us to just you know pick me something generic or copy some other company's business model, and we'll happily do that. But um, but that's the one thing you might want to think about is what business model do I want to have here? But it's not a technical business model. Just say it in your normal language. I want to pay so-and-so. I want to share with so-and-so. I want this book to only work for a year because I have another edition that I plan to issue a year from now. Whatever you can say, we'll put it in. So just plain English. And then uh, any time that you... Uh, well, I, again, I want to plug the public guide idea because an author probably has a catalog um, and it hasn't been published on the blockchain before. So uh, you may want some help in how to package that and that's uh, for your blockchain campaign and its perennial selling thereafter. But again, that's not a technical issue. That's just trying to explain what business model do you want and how do you want to market the book. And if you don't want to market it yourself, um, what kind of digital shelf do you want to create? So the shelf, uh, I call it digital because, um, because there's so much com computers are behind it. But it's better to think of it as an author, just like your shelves at home. Why did I put those books together? And uh, a public guide can help you uh, just think that through. And then the public guide can knows what to do at Publica to explain to us the smart contract or the digital shelf that you want your books to be on. Um, so it's uh, nothing new has to be learned. <laughs> but it, but if you if you want to, it's all there. Uh, yeah. I feel like I've got many. Uh, how long have you been in business? And a follow-up question: mm -hmm. have, have you ever um, had an author say who doesn't have has a large email list, but they're not completely there in terms of being fans? Um, you know, disenroll of, um, because they're getting too many emails. Ah, right, the unsubscribes, the, the unsubscribe. right, the, the, the spam problem. Um, uh, we announced Publica on December 1st at Future Book. So this is uh, brand new. And the, uh, the, first, um, uh, the first major book will be announced in about a month, within a month. So uh, we're doing registrations now for those who want to publish on the blockchain. So this is right at the beginning. Although the uh, the company has been working for a year on the technology and the marketing and um, practicing, because <laughs> we want this to be hassle free for the authors. Um, so the mailing list. Um, I'm trying not to address you know spam in general, but the 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 design of the author's journey uh, for us, we call it a book. 
ICO. It's another phrase for it. So I have to tell you what an ICO means. Initial coin offering. Although, of course, we're not issuing actual coins, right? <laughs> we're, not, not, we're not mailing you any of these. <laughs> but but uh, it's just become slang for these book tokens. So it'll be interesting to people whether they're interested in your genre or not to learn so why is this a different way to buy books in general? So there's an interest point there. The mailing lists that, that we send out, if the publicans, our publicans, our fans of, of the uh, public company, um, when they look at the author's description, you know, what, you know, whatever the author says they want to do, like, do they want to crowdfund a book to finish it? Do they want to crowdfund a book to start it? <laughs> is the book completely done? And they just want to go right to the perennial seller page and skip the the, uh, the crowdfunding stage. Uh, the publicans will look at that and they'll say, "Well, I think so and so would be interested in that." And so there are lots of other channels besides email that people use to communicate and draw each other in. But what they keep drawing them to eventually is to an email list. Right? We have these live chat channels and social media and, and so on. But it keeps boiling down to an email list of who wants to be emailed about. Um, and we call that permission marketing. right? Who gives you permission to market to them? And for what reason? So, uh, and public doesn't change the dynamics of permission marketing. It is what it is. You give someone permission to e email you. And if you don't like what they do with it, then you unsubscribe. What we're doing with the, because of the blockchain, it becomes global. So you reach people and get permission to market to them who you didn't know before and had no other way of getting to know without using a megaphone, just by whispering across the picnic table. So I think um, I've answered uh, all. Is there any last question? So. So what we're going to do is, uh, I believe we're going to take this and put it upstairs um, somewhere in, uh, and have a table out for the next couple of days where whatever you've heard here, now you can say blockchain. Go tell someone about a blockchain. <laughs> and you say, go, go talk to those guys about publishing on the blockchain. All right, thanks. <laughs>